Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, July the 12th, 2006. I'm Lee Cook, and with us today is Dave Brown. Dave is a longtime director of facilities and operations, finishing as associate vice president in that post. Had almost 30 years there. Has seen a lot of things, much of the buildings, the grounds, the changes, and today we're going to explore those changes. Dave, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. If we'd start out, Dave, just give us a little bit of your early history, your education, how you grew up, went to school, and take us up to where you came to UAH. Well, I was raised in Birmingham, Alabama. I went to Auburn University, graduated in 1962. Uh, came to work for Brown Engineering in Huntsville at that point, and which is now Teledyne Brown Engineering. Uh, back in those days, people changed jobs very rapidly because of opportunities to increase salaries. I went to work for Chrysler Corporation after two years with Brown. After about 16 months, the contract that Chrysler had, and Brown was also part of that, was bid and awarded to Brown. So I went back to Brown Engineering, supporting NASA, and worked on the arsenal and all uh, during that time. And in 1972, uh, NASA had a cutback in their support contractor uh, support. And at that point, I was laid off with many other engineers here in Huntsville. I was I fortunate that. enough yeah. at that time that uh, Earl Jacoby was a good friend of mine who worked for Dr. Joe Dowdle. And Dr. Dowdle had a one-year study to do a facilities inventory program for UAH. And Dr. Dowdle hired me in September of 1972 into that position. And uh, he was my mentor. And we finished that program about January of 1974. We got a little bit of an extension on it. And I continued to work in the facilities planning, facilities inventory arena until March, April 1975 when there were some people who left the physical plant. And I was assigned there on an interim basis uh, because of my background in engineering as well as my uh, work with all the facilities because I had been in every building on this campus during that inventory process, measuring rooms and all, and was very familiar with the campus. And after a period of about six weeks, uh, Dr. Allen and I went to lunch one day and he said, I'm very satisfied with you. Are you satisfied doing this kind of work? And I said, yes, sir. I've enjoyed it. And he said, well, we'll go ahead and make this thing permanent. So I became the director of physical plant at that point in 1975 and continued on in that road. To give you a little background, in 1975, uh, UH had about 3,300 students. Our facilities inventory comprised of about 550,000 gross square feet. And uh, the physical plant operating budget at that time uh, was 470 some odd thousand dollars and we had a hundred and twenty five thousand dollar utility budget let me, let me stop you right there so that before we get too far can you do you remember or give us an approximation when you left in 2003 we just heard those numbers give us the corresponding numbers utility budget went from one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars up to 2.7 million in 2003. And the operating budget for all the salaries, operating expenses of the facilities department went from 472 up to 4.5 million. Now our gross square footage had gone from 550,000 square feet up to about 2.2 million. So we had added a tremendous amount of facilities during that time. What was really ironic when I did this work prior to retiring was looking at the growth. We had 71 employees in the department in 75, and we had 126 
So even though the institution wow. had grown fourfold or so in square footage, we had not even doubled in our number of employees in the department. You were running a lean ship. Our staffing was, was, was minimal, and I always felt like that was our downfall, is that we couldn't provide enough staff to accomplish the task we needed to. Funding was, was somewhat of an issue, but it was more of not having the manpower to do the day-to-day -day things that need to be done. So that's kind of the, the background, and you know, you have to think back, the early buildings was, were Morton Hall Research Institute, that was 62, 64. Madison Hall was completed in 66, and then there was a little spurt in 69. They had the first phase of the library, right. Wilson Hall, which those two buildings were designed and constructed under design and one contract for the design and one contract for the construction. And then the initial University Union, the Interim Union right. building, right. was 69 well. there. And then Roberts Hall in 71, so those were the buildings for right. numerous years, and they brought in the four annexes behind Morton Hall right. that allowed some, some uh, office space and all growth there, yeah, those and those were about else, 67. Yeah. So the fact that I came in 72, I was involved or, or saw the growth of this campus tremendously. And the 70s was a busy time because we added the addition to the library. The nursing building opened in 76, Spragans Hall. We had the medical school facilities at that point. Right. Uh, the old ambulatory care center was completed about 76 or so. Clinical Science Center came on in the 70s also, which was the old Kroger grocery store. So an awful lot of growth during that period of time. We also the uh, Johnson Research Center, which was the old auto check yeah, program. Auto -check program. Yes. And then the temporary auto check building was moved down and which is now the central receiving and shipping building. And all that was in the seventies. So fair amount of growth during that time. Yeah, and as I recall, we were we were pretty efficient in ways we took buildings and added to and renovated rather than starting all over. Right. Uh, so that goes along with your lean, lean shop. Morton Hall was, had the addition to it in 77. Mm -hmm. And then Wilson Hall, the, the, what was called the Environmental Studies Edition, right. was completed in 75. So the 70s were a fairly busy time. Mm -hmm. And you also have to remember the facilities department was working at that time out of what was an old small house what had been a chicken house yeah, at one time that. had been was was where the shops were, and then there were three office trailers that provided office space. So we always said we were in the rock house, the chicken house, and trailers, and we were. And sitting, you were. And we were. And we were sitting at the corner of uh, what was then South Loop Road and Holmes Avenue, the southwest corner, which was a very good location from the standpoint that we could see the north end of the campus, and there was very few facilities on the south end. And we were able to move into the current fiscal plant building in August of 1981, which put us on the south end of the campus, but gave us very nice facilities, gave us uh, some storage facilities and all for the grounds equipment, and parking and all for all the vehicles. So that turned out to be a very nice uh, move for us to be able to do that. Uh, the 80s again brought on some growth and all because the university center was built around the old interim union building and uh, it has not physically been added on to since then. There's been a good bit of inter interior renovations of the university union. But, uh, you know, uh, those things were happening and uh, I guess early 90s was probably another major spurt when we had the optics building, material science building, the central plant that serves those two buildings, the central campus residence hall, right. the administrative science building, and then the aerophysics facility that was constructed on the uh, Redstone Arsenal. All of those construction projects were going on at the same time. And of course, we inherited the, the maintenance responsibilities for all those buildings except the aerophysics. Facility. Anything that went wrong, it was your problem to solve it, huh? <laughs> well, human nature is, uh, you know, everybody has a complaint, but very few people take the time to say thank you for anything. Right. So, 
you know, and we went through some administrative changes in our hierarchy here at the institution where Dr. Graves had stepped down from being president and John Wright came in and uh, Joe Dowdle, who had been, uh, as I said, my mentor, left here in 84 and went to the systems office in Tuscaloosa and had a new VP who came here from Michigan State University in which was a much larger institution, much better funded, who expected a little more than we were able to provide. So went through some periods there and... Uh, then when Dr. Wright decided to step down as president, uh, we had, uh, I believe, Dr. Louis Padulo came in then, and uh, he made life tough for lots of us. And, uh, yes, he did. It wasn't just on the administrative side. <laughs> he was a challenge. He uh, loved to get input, so he would hold... I won't call them town meetings, but he would want the, the staff in all the various departments to meet with him and tell him all the things that were wrong and need to do. And so I had him take me by the hand and carry me around to numerous buildings on campus showing me things that need to be done. And, and uh, hot water in the ladies' restrooms became a high priority in several of our buildings. And so we had to do that. And uh, But, you know... Uh, I was involved in, in some areas of reporting to some of the prominent people here in town some of the questionable things that Dr. Padulo did that involved my area that were not quite according to state codes and all. And uh, so I had to be very careful in that situation to be sure that I wasn't putting my own neck on the line, but yet protecting my staff and doing what was, frankly, the best for the institution. And uh, and when Joe Moquin came in and served in an interim basis, uh, Joe took the philosophy. It was right around that 90 period when we was building buildings, and he didn't think new buildings required any maintenance, so you didn't need any money to maintain them, and you didn't need any new staff because you had a year's warranty on them. <laughs> I had several discussions with my counterpart at Teledyne Brown, John Fisher, during those times of how things worked with he and Mr. Mokman. And Mr. Mokman became a very good supporter, and, and we worked well together. It just took that initial break in and all. And, uh, and when the, Dr. Franz came, when Frank Franz came, uh, things have gone very well in that relationship. Uh, at that time, Ken uh, Jerry Quick was the Vice President for Finance and Administration. He had come here during Badulo's term and continued on, and Jerry was an excellent person to work with and, and very supportive. And so the institution continued to grow, uh, mostly through funding of selling bonds or federal funds and not limited uh, funds from the state to build our facilities. And again, we were building a lots of square footage without adding a whole lot of headcount enrollment. Therefore, the revenue coming in there was, was making it tough to keep up with the ongoing operation of, of the institution, in particular the facility side. Uh, contracts and grants, uh, revenue was increasing, and we have an awful lot of gross square footage on this campus in research space. It, right. it doesn't bring in that many students on a day-to-day -day basis. It's very important as an institution, but again, it doesn't bring in the revenue source through student uh, tuition and fees. So, you know, we've seen a, a tremendous amount of growth, and uh, during that period of the 70s, the university started acquiring houses over in what was the Sanderson subdivision and have now reached the point, the last I was told, that owned all but five of those initial 35 houses. 35. And they're moving them. They're in the process right now of moving those houses off campus. The, the new campus master plan calls for the area to be green space. It will be a, a green pathway from the north end of the campus all the way into the engineering, building, material science, optics, complex. Nothing all. in there at all? No. Uh, That's a lot of land. Lots of land. 
Uh, but of course, speaking of the use at a later date. At day. some point, you know, there was some discussion at one time of putting the Greek housing uh, there and kind of frame that. They talked about maybe some intramural fields in their initial use of that land. Uh, the new parking deck is, is going to be constructed when federal funding comes through. The, where the old Ashman complex was across right. from the fitness center. Part of that, that would be one thing in the green space, that, but the only on thing. the fringe of it, right. yes. Right. And they have hopes of, of, at some point, elevating Holmes Avenue some and depressing what is now Erskine Street to go under Holmes to have an open walkway, not a tunnel, to be able to, to go to the longer. library, nursing building, Roberts Hall area without having to physically cross Home and that's an expensive project, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and so you know, those are things that that are being worked on, and, and hopefully will allow the institution to continue to grow. Uh, the north, the second phase of the North Campus Residence Hall has been completed since. Uh, looks retired. very nice. Yeah, that entire complex looks nice. And we had acquired the Shelby King Hall. Uh, building prior to uh, me leaving, and, and that building is there. The new Applied Sciences building, which is going to be a, a massive building on our campus, just north of Madison Hall, is, is under construction, moving well. Uh, they're in the process of building a second lake. Uh, they're shoveling dirt, too. I there, imagine. and therefore the entrance road from Lakeside Drive will now be changed to where it will come off of Sparkman, where the current traffic light is, and actually go to a, a roundabout mm -hmm. almost at the new Applied Sciences building and uh, tie the roads and all back there. So there's going to be a good bit of effort uh, put into beautifying the campus and making it more pedestrian friendly. And uh, I think as the institution grows and, and the full-time enrollment continues to grow, we'll need more pedestrian friendly areas in all congregation spaces. So that's, you know, kind of my uh, career here. I still do what I call drive-by inspections. I come out and drive around the road and just see what's going on. And I have lunch with some of the people in the department and still go by there some and ask about the construction projects because that was the one area I did enjoy tremendously was the interaction with the... Uh, design people, the architects and engineers, the contractors, the city officials, and all, in, in getting things accomplished. And, a little uh, closer to your engineering background. Yeah, and so I always enjoy that. We had the unfortunate experience of having three of our projects where the general contractor uh, went bankrupt, and we had to bring in bonding companies to complete those projects. And my early exposure was on the old ambulatory care center. That contractor folded, and bonding company had to come in. So I had some experience when that happened on our first big residence hall with uh, J.T. Scrimshire Construction Company. They also yeah, they went into bankruptcy before the building was completed, and I had to deal with the bonding company. And then when we built... The you were under, at that point, let me interject, you were under a lot of pressure, too, because that thing had to be had open. To be it was going to be open fall yeah. of whatever that year was. And yeah. you you were with, I mean, you were still scraping away the dirt, as I recall, when the students were walking in. Well, that's true. I probably put in more hours during that one yeah, or two you were under a lot of pressure because we had just had finished the administrative science, but we were also doing material science and optics and central plant same time and as usual whenever we have a deadline of when a building has to be completed it seems like the institution is the one that takes all the time to make the decisions and then the architect <laughs> engineers have to design it and then the poor contractor is given the minimal amount of time but uh, I will give Scrimpture credit that was a 12 month project they completed the project we moved in the Sunday of move-in, I was out here, and three of Scripture's employees, without any request, showed up, wanted to know what could be done. They were washing down sidewalks. They helped carry in luggage. So even though we'd had a contractor who went under, we had employees of that contractor who were dedicated to seeing that mm -hmm. it was finished. 
Then when we had our second residence hall construction, that contractor also got into financial problems. I didn't know that. The, so the first one in the complex in front of Morton Hall? Yes. Okay. What's called North Campus Residence Hall, and the, the one that's been built since then was, was called North Campus Residence Hall 2. But we had concerns going in when we opened bids because the word on the street was that they were having some trouble based on other projects. Our architect did a very thorough job of checking with owners, architects on other projects that we had references on and didn't have a strong basis of saying, no, you can't do it. We met with a couple of local trustees and talked to them about it and were advised that, you know, if you don't have something documented, you're really taking a chance. And one of the trustees had had business dealings with this contractor, and he said, I'll tell you, he will take you to court right now unless you have something strong to stand up with. So we went into it really concerned, and then I had some of the subs that came to me and said, hey, we're not getting paid. We, you know, we can't continue this job. Had meetings with the contractor and his project manager and uh, found out that they, they were taking our payments and were keeping other jobs going. Go and I finally at that point had to sit down and make contact with his uh, bond surety uh, out of Franklin, Tennessee and had it officially documented in letters to the bonding company. And I have to say the bonding company sent some representatives in and they took full responsibility and they worked very well with us, kept the job going, got all the contractors caught up on pay and, and, and we got the job. As well. I remember we were on a short fuse there too. Yes. They were they were basically walking in the door and you were scraping the dirt we away. We had to forego completing the entire building. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of students that had signed up for housing did not necessarily require that the entire building be finished. Mm -hmm. so we had to work with city officials to see how, from a fire code standpoint, we could petition off the one area, allow the workers to continue to work there, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. have people living in the other portion. Because it gets into uh, fire alarm systems. If you have contractor working in an unfinished area and you don't have the fire protection, system hooked up there, there. that would alarm the people in the other building right. if there was some kind of fire or smoke situation. So it's been been some interesting experience and like I said I thoroughly enjoyed working with uh, the various people here on campus but as well as the, the local architects, contractors and all. And uh, I think the fitness center which was completed late in my career is another uh, fine building that has benefited the students and all on this campus. Talk to us a little bit about that thing. As I, as I, as I recall, there's some sort of a, uh, it's a complicated type of deal. It it's really uh, belongs to an off-campus entity, and, but mm. how, how does that go? Initially, there were two local people who wanted to build a large fitness center. One of them already had, uh, I guess it's all right to name names, yeah. Mark Noble, who right. already had some physical fitness facilities himself, John Goodrum, a local architect, who has a, a disability through uh, the generating uh, medical condition and was very much into it. They had looked across the U.S. at different facilities. They initially approached the institution about getting a long-term ground lease on our campus mm -hmm. and build a facility here that would be tied into the institution to where the institution could could use it. Financially, that wasn't going to work. Institutionally, the decision made, we didn't want to give that up. There had been some planning. That being the land. The land yeah. and, and the facility on our campus belonging to somebody, somebody else. else. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there had been plans, planning going on for several years for a new recreation facility for students. The students had been paying additional student activity fee for that, a building fee. So the institution joined with Mark Noble and John Goodrum to form kind of a partnership where the institution would build the building. They would be heavily involved in the design of the building, the, the specification and then they would manage the facility. The university would contract with them to manage and staff the facility. So uh, that was the way it was. Uh, 
So the building is ours, but the operational costs are from the outside entity. All the, the employees in the building are part of what's called, uh, I'm not sure what it is. It's, uh, it seems like it's University Club LLC or something, you know. But those two individuals uh, still have some uh, involvement in the institution. There's income based on actual revenue and then operating expenses, and they receive compensation as part of that. But in the end, the building and the land remain ours. The ours. building is ours. Well, that's, that's, that's very helpful because I get a lot of questions about yeah. that, and I really didn't know the ins and outs. It's almost like the arrangement that we've had at the Bevel Center because the Bevel Center initially uh, was under the management of the Marriott Corporation. Right. Now Marriott has spun off that to Sodexo. So the management of all, all the employees who support that, the food service, the hotel side, uh, are all Marriott Sodexo employees. Uh, the maintenance employees who actually are assigned there are UAH, but they're the only UAH no employees issue. who are housed there to support the facility. So once again, the operating costs, except for a few, are we're not worried about that. Yeah. The building and the grounds are yeah. ours. Well, that's, that's and, and that's, you know, there, in both of those, there's revenue that comes into the institution based on a percentage of whatever the the income is based on taking out operating costs and then so whatever they make, any yeah. profit, we yeah. get a cut, yeah. as as in the as in the gym. Yeah. Okay, well, that's that's helpful. Now I can uh, say it with authority. I got it from the right from the horse's mouth. <laughs> I guess the only building that probably is on our campus that doesn't belong to the institution is the Alabama Credit Union. To whom does it belong? It belongs the to the Alabama Credit Union. Oh. How about the land underneath it? That's UAH. Okay. Gotcha. So it's WRH, just like actually, they have paid for the cost in all of constructing that building, majority of the cost, but that is a UH building also, where the public radio station is. Well, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that. Dave, I know it's interesting to talk to you to realize how broad a scope of responsibilities you have, you know, worrying about dealing with the bonding company, worrying about dealing with the architects, worrying about this, that. Uh, what would you say was your most stressful uh, project, and why? Surely you have a number of them. <laughs> well, I would have to say the Central Campus Residence Hall, yeah, because yeah. that was during Padulo's time. A very stressful period on campus, the whole yes, campus. Yes, the whole campus, and uh, with the other construction projects we had going on, and. I probably was not a very good administrator from the standpoint of delegating uh, lots of the responsibilities in handling the contractual end of our construction projects. I, I managed all the construction contracts, the pay requests, the inspections, kept up with all of that with my support of my staff, but those were the ones that came directly to me and, and I had to oversee that. So keeping up with that many construction projects at one time and then having the the deadline we had on the Central Campus Residence Hall and, and trying to get it finished up because that was so critical because we had the students lined up ready to come right. in. Right, and there had been a lot of publicity yeah. about it. Uh, yeah. Well, you, once again, though, you're awful lean. I don't think you had an associate director, did you? Uh, uh, or, yes. Oh, you did? Yes. Okay. I always had an assistant director there. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of supervisory staff, you know, below that, minimal. And, uh, but yes, yes. Uh, Clarence Driggers was there for several years, and then Rayburn Murphy was there later. Murphy. And okay. A lot of the, the, lean. There a wasn't a lot of folks. Day to day yeah. responsibilities. I didn't get that involved in. You know, I knew yeah. what was going on. Kept, uh, but uh, when we had that much construction going, I was involved in awful lots of meetings. And I was going to say you're talking about uh, one, two, three, four buildings, counting the central residence. Major, major buildings. 
Uh, I guess you worked a few Saturdays and Sundays, didn't you? Uh, <laughs> I told Jerry Quick one time when I went to an Apple Institute in San Antonio, Texas, and I left on a Sunday and I came back on a Friday, and I told him that was the longest period of time I'd been away from my office since I'd been there. And your office was piled high. Huh? Yeah. That's the only problem with going away. You know, I've called, come back. I've, called, I've called you before on Sunday morning when we had... Oh, the flood. Yes, in the Hall. flood. Yeah, uh, that's right. So, I, yeah. I remember it well. I swept my chair of water and cleaned up stuff and, and uh, been there late at night, been there all night. And, you know, I always felt like it was important if we had people working that I would try to be present. So... I vaguely remember something about an all-night vigil keeping buildings warm enough so that they wouldn't freeze up. Uh, well, am I remembering that story? Yeah. Tell me, but tell us about that story. Well, Research Institute was. We had the during the heating season, very extreme cold weather. We had the hot water pump go out on the circulation system that circulated water throughout the building to the little individual fan coil units in all the, the rooms and uh, we couldn't couldn't get a replacement in a timely fashion and so we went out and bought almost little ever a little small electric heater that any of the stores in Huntsville had we had probably a close to a hundred and so we plugged them in throughout the building kept them going we were always concerned about any of the coils rupturing there in the computer room and getting underneath the raised flooring. And we had people in the building all night walking halls and uh, with radios. And if one of these coils, it got worse once we got the pump going because some of the units had frozen up, but once we started circulating water, it thawed out the ice that in the ruptured coils and then water would start spewing all over the place. So we'd have people, maintenance people, who'd go around and shut off the coils at that point, and we'd mark that one to replace it, uh, to repair it at a later time. So we a lot of overtime that night, we, I guess. We, we had that. With my, yeah. I guess one of them I remember is that when we had the CBs doing work on dredging out our lake, and I always felt like anything free is worth a bunch of headaches. <laughs> Because you get what you pay for. <laughs> yeah. So they were available one week in a month, and they'd get out of here Saturday, finally get all their big drag lines and equipment out of here and get set up. And so they'd get about a half a day in and a half a day on Sunday, and they'd have to load everything up and take it off again. And uh, Clarence Triggers was, was kind of coordinating, overseeing that. And... Uh, one Sunday afternoon, they were just north of Lakeside Drive, and they were going to drop that big boom down in there and scoop up some dirt before they quit. And they hit an eight-inch water main that was underneath that area. So water started squirting sky high, and that water main served the whole south end of the campus, everything south of Holmes Avenue at that time. And that was Research Institute and Madison Hall and Johnson Research Center and several other places. So uh, I called Dr. Dowdle and said, you know, we're going to have to close some buildings tomorrow. We don't have any water, don't have any restrooms. And he said, no, we're not going to close. Can't you get it fixed? So I started calling and, and located the plumber who said, yeah, he'd come out. We had the water shut off, and it was cold. I mean, really cold. And uh, Charlie Hill, who was our ground supervisor at that time, was very resourceful. And I got Charlie out here. And uh, the contractor came out and he said, if you can get me the pipe, I can get it fixed. So I had to get somebody from Huntsville Utilities to come in at 11 o'clock that night to go down to their supply yard to open up to get us pipe. And they brought their equipment in and started digging, trying to relocate that line. And Charlie and I went and found a 55-gallon drum that one of the contractors had been using for a fire barrel. And we found some lumber and... He and I stood around in it, around it, trying to stay warm. And contractors down in the water with their suits and wetsuits and stuff on, trying to do work. And I remember I stood so close to that fire that I found out I had burned holes in the back of my pants, my polyester pants, back in those days. <laughs> and I went home at 1:30 that morning, and they were still working. They said they would have it on the next morning, and. Uh, guy on the radio said the temperature was 11 degrees at that point. Mm. And uh, so we had guys standing 
than it was working in water during that time. And sure enough, we had the water back on by mid-morning. And uh, so that, that was probably one of the, the more challenging ones. Uh, Dr. Dowdle had said, well, we'll just call some of these uh, Portageon places in the morning and we'll get them to bring out Portageons and put in the lobby. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine Madison Hall with the president's office having a little portable toilet set up in the lobby. Neither could I. So, learn to be resourceful. And say, so your, your job was definitely not just a paper pusher job, was no. it? No. That's a funny story. What happens now? We, we've just uh, advent or with uh, the Shelby Center or the uh, Applied Sciences building, that comes online, and the parking deck comes online. Uh, in the master plan, what's next? And, of course, the green space, moving the houses. Yeah, of the green course, space. the Greek houses are coming. The Greek houses, that's right. They will the Greek this, this, this they fall. They have this fall. That's and, right. Um, Tremendous amount going on. Yeah. I, I, from a facility standpoint, I don't think there's anything major planned right now. Mm -hmm. But from a... a the aesthetics or grounds, they want to take out the uh, the Ben Graves Drive area between Morton Hall and North Campus Residence Hall and make that into green space and change the entrance to where you can uh, basically at some point start right across Roberts Hall where that chain link fence is at University Place School. Mm -hmm. and build your entry road out towards University Drive and tie in and, and have a loop there. So when you came in off of University Drive, you could continue to your right and go towards Wilson Hall. The old way, Or you yeah. could come back to, left, to the left and come towards in Roberts Hall University Center. I and see. And then that, yeah, that cut across in front of can yeah. go. That can, can go. go. And then they will revamp the University Center parking lot also to put more green space and all into it to make it a little more pedestrian friendly. Like science building, put some trees and things in, yes. that kind of thing. Yes. So, you know, those are the things I think it's, it's in the, the planning stages. Uh, they want to take the access off of this library nursing building parking lot and, and basically take out that parking lot and move it over to the hillside of the nursing building where you would come in off of Ben Gray's Drive into it again to open up green space. I see. Yeah. yeah. It would be green yeah. all the way from all the way up to the nursing Hall, basically up to the Robert's nursing Hall, building. All the way down across right, right. under over Holmes Avenue down towards Wow, that's a tremendous amount of land. Yeah, yeah. Of course it can be built on later if yeah. it's needed. And, and you know, uh, our campus has always provided very convenient parking to the individual facilities. And there was a lots of concern expressed when the master plan concept was put out about moving this parking lot out here and moving it further away, uh, particularly from, from the library staff. So there was a concession made where there could be a, a, a access road like a drop-off where you could come in, come through the parking lot, and, and still come up to the front of the library for book drop-off and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. As far as parking, it was... Uh, well, the parking deck will be convenient. Well, yes. but you'll still have to cross home. You'll so. have to cross home that's unless they work the other situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, uh, the campus will change, the face of the campus. And with taking the houses out of the Sanderson subdivision, mm -hmm. that will allow them to come in and, and grade that area and, 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 you know, start sprucing that up. And that's really going to be necessary to get that parking deck in in order to support the Madison Hall Applied Sciences Building. Right. Because Madison Hall has lost a tremendous amount of parking uh, as part of the construction and will lose more than half of that parking lot. As I learned finished. teaching a course this past spring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you. I think the institution will continue to grow and. Uh, I think, you know, it's heading in the right direction. Well, in the last five years, well, since I retired, the whole face of the campus has changed. I haven't retired 10 years ago. And I have a lot more empathy for your position now 
didn't realize it until I hear it talked about all the things you had to do and uh, how lean you were there uh, in, in terms of your yeah. staffing. I mean, your, 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 your square footage from when you took over went up five times. And yet your, and of course, your, your staffing went up not even Less twice. Than, right, correct. Uh, well, is there anything we've left out here, Dave? Things that uh, that uh, you'd like to point out, or or some peculiarities, uh, things that you can say to the public. <laughs> I'm sure there's some things that will shall always remain buried. Well, you know, the university is going to continue to change, and we realize we have all these new facilities, but also. We have disposed of facilities, uh, the original university apartments across University Drive, served the institution for years. The medical school facilities down there uh, were transferred over to UAB, and within the last year or so, the old first phase of the medical school, the administrative building just north of Madison Hall, which later became continuing ed, and then the alumni house mm -hmm. has been disposed of to make room for expansion. Uh, I think there are plans, uh, I don't know how far along they are, to build another preschool learning center. I s saw something and about clear that. Up that. Free up that spot right up there too. Right. It will open up the, administra the uh, applied sciences building from a visual standpoint significantly from right. Holmes Avenue. From home to, yeah. You know, yeah, it's too close to that building, that, that applied science building yeah. now, that the preschool, the current preschool it, it learning center. It was initially perceived that it would be removed before construction would start, and therefore they could use that site as a staging area for the construction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last that Ina uh, was told that they were looking at building a new preschool learning center over at uh, Technology Hall, in the very west parking lot, the green space, there was a picnic area mm -hmm. that had remained there from years ago when IBM owned that whole right. complex. Right. And to maybe utilize that green area to build the preschool learning center. I think the, the ground elevation was something that was going to be addressed because of the drainage structure behind it. Uh, that would be able, if I'm remembering right, they could also, that, that would greatly expand the, the space available so yes. they could take care of more faculty, staff, students, uh, uh, children. Give us the, the, the children there more green space access and all to mm -hmm. and takes mm -hmm. them off of that busy that Holmes busy Avenue. Holmes Avenue. Yeah. Right, right, right. Let's see, didn't you were talking about disposing of buildings. Did we also dispose of the old computer science building? Or yes, is that, that, still, that okay. is correct. Okay. Uh, right. uh, Biztech has acquired that building yeah. and all and, and, and remodeled, renovated it. So we've been very efficient and effective in the way we have, we're building. We're not just building and building and building. We're getting rid of things that we don't need any longer and, and, and receiving we've buildings. buildings. You know, the, the building right. across the street that, uh, that Teledan Brown was using there at one time that belonged to a developer here in town, Bob Heath, the NSSTC building. And we've added the addition to that, the, the two buildings. That's right, that, and you were involved in that, yes. weren't you? That, that you? You forgot to tell us about that. <laughs> and, uh, of course, uh, t the Technology Hall. The technology Hall there, and, and then uh, the, the Shelby, King. Shelby King Hall, which two buildings that were built in the early 60s, you know, when IBM was. Was had a big foothold here in Huntsville. You had to do a lot in Technology Hall. I remember. Weren't there high bays and things? They had a lot of things to be done to make them. Technology useful. Hall was basically gutted out mm -hmm. uh, as far as the ceilings and lights and, and several walls and, and, and all that, and redone and made it into a, a very, very nice building. Uh, it's, it's a very sound building and by putting a new heating, cooling, ventilating system in and new lights and floor finishes and stuff, it's really spruced it up makes it look good. And I think the SCI people that were involved in helping the institution acquire that were very pleased with the renovation of that too. Do we have to do much to Shelby King? 
There has not been a whole lot done to Shelby King Hall. Uh, yeah, it, well, having been in there a couple of times, it looked like it was pretty much ready to go for what we're using it for. Yeah. That had been their administrative building initially. It had some very nice spaces, very nice wall coverings, and very, very large offices. And uh, Huntsville Hospital had been in there prior to the university acquiring it. And uh, no, they had uh, they had some of their data processing uh, areas and all located there. And uh, they had done a good job of making some improvements too. So has not been a whole lot of upgrades in that building. Probably the thing that needs the most attention is their their HVAC system and their restroom facilities because they're they're very dated at this point. One more thing um, I get asked about, and, and people have asked me about, and I can't answer it. Uh, the home downtown on William Street that was, I guess, given to us um, through through the bequest of, of the gal, I can't call her name right now, low, the low home. Uh, am I correct that that's to be the, the president's home starting from the next one, or not? I, I had very, very, very limited involvement in that property. Mm -hmm. It belongs to the foundation. Okay, that's the first the question. The I, foundation, I, I, foundation owns it. was totally responsible for the renovation, upgrading, furnishing, and all of that house. I had also heard that that was a goal was the next president would live there. Uh, they made it, I think, where the Franzes could live there, but I don't think Dr. Franz was ever really willing to make that move. Well, he had, they have a nice home that they've already invested a lot in, so I can understand that. that that's why I said the next president. I mean, we certainly have a precedent for that sort of yeah. thing and the right to live in a home downtown. And right? Graves. Uh, and uh, that's true. We had the one on Adam Street that's right. the that's right. Graves had, and then uh, uh, John and, and Mac Wright lived in it too. Oh, before they lived on Eccles. Yes. I did not know that. Okay. Yes. They and, lived on Adams Street and first. When the university was approached by the Spragans family and all about the Eccles Hill property, uh, the university uh, accepted that, and Dr. Wright and Mrs. Wright were willing to make that move. And then the Adam Street home was sold. Was sold. Was sold. Right. And frankly, you know, Padulo lived in the uh, Echoes Hill and had some modifications made to, to meet his needs. And when Dr. Franz and his wife came, I think they wanted to have the investment of owning a home. Mm -hmm. And so they resisted uh, having to, to locate and move there. At that point, the university canceled the, the lease arrangement with the family with that house, and, uh, which then basically put the family in position since none of the children or descendants lived here to sell the house. And so it was sold. Right, it was point. sold. I remember yeah. when it was sold. Well, oh, thanks for clearing that up because I do get asked, yeah. and I... I don't know what yeah. the status will be yeah. with the new president. It may very well be that the new president will want to own his own, yeah. his or her own house, and the same thing. Well, Dave, anything else that we missed? Uh, I have learned a lot, and I've been here for as longer than you have. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, we crossed paths many times. Absolutely. And, and, well, uh, it was always a pleasure to do business with you, but I have a Same great you. deal more admiration for the sort of job you you had. I had no idea of the breadth. Well, I've always uh, acknowledged the support that I had, but more important, the, doc the department had from the vice presidents I served under, Joe mm -hmm. Dow, Jerry Quick, Ray Penner. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly with Ben Gray's, he was, I think Ben was instrumental in, in recommending suggestion that I go into that position and then uh, John Wright for sure and, and also Frank Franz uh, was mm -hmm. very supportive of the department and assisted greatly in providing additional funds at times to help with 
salary increases and all, but, mm -hmm. uh, that's the biggest drawback is the, the salary the level salary scale. Yeah. what we were able to pay. And uh, that has been a, a high priority, it was always a high priority for me, and fortunately it had the support that we were able to do some special things in terms of well, maybe with this last, this this good year and last year, good year, and uh, some of those problems are being remedied. I think lots of those problems have gotten uh, improved tremendously. Right. They should be. But I appreciate this opportunity. And like I said I certainly enjoyed my career here, and it was very rewarding to, to me personally. And as somebody told me one time, one thing about being in facilities, you can always look back and see what you did. And, yeah. And yeah. How you were involved, and, and Jerry Moore from Human Resources you said, you know, what can I look back and say? This is what I did, <laughs> yeah. and I can't say I did anything. I can say we did an awful lot out here. Well, talking to you sounds like you did an awful lot too, and I appreciate you coming, Dave. Yes, sir. Thank you so much Thank for giving you. us your time. Appreciate it.